logic. Plain old common sense. I recall some years ago, I was sitting with friends and we were discussing the matter of life. Where did we come from? How did we get here? What's the purpose of life? And then what would be the logic behind it all? And we didn't seem to be able to come up with any kind of answers. I read books of philosophy and sat with some people that were pretty smart in a lot of areas in various sciences and disciplines. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to sit with the scholars and teachers of Islam that I began to see the real logic, the deep logic behind so many things. For instance, where did everything come from? Is there a common source? Is there intelligence behind everything? Now today, scientists tell us that there are certain things that have just basically popped up in creation that they are unable to account for. Things that do not have a source that they came or evolved from. In other words, it appears that there is something called creation instead of just evolution. So much so that those scientists that adhere to that notion have come up with a nomenclature or name for it they call it ID for intelligent design. They're afraid to go any further than that, afraid to say there might be a God, but they are committed to the idea that there's something intelligent out there, some force, some thinking entity that has caused things to come about. Of course, as soon as they say that, those who want to hold fast to the idea of atheism those who would like to deny any kind of creator, those who would like to continue to promote this so-called theory of evolution, those folks are going to be very much against these guys with their ID or intelligent design. And they're going to say, that's not logical. But on the other hand, if you really think about it, what is logic? Think, if you acknowledge that there is a system then you have to acknowledge that it came from somewhere. Things do not come about in organized fashion simply by chance. Let us consider that if you take a drinking glass and throw it down on the cement, it will break or shatter into many different parts. If you take another glass just like it and throw it down the same way, it will also break but not in the same way not with the same parts. And if you did that again and again and again, you will just see a lot of broken glass. But never, not one time out of millions, if you throw the glass down, will it ever form little small drinking glasses. Never. And by this same token, if you consider a junkyard, metal salvage, and a big wind or tornado comes through, and picks up this metal and starts to twist it around and throw it around and move it and shape it and reshape it. Never in the history of the universe would it occur that all of this metal would come down and form a brand new automobile with a motor running, would it? Never. And anybody who said so, you would just laugh at them. And if I ask you something as simple as the chair that I'm sitting in, where did it come from? And you'd say, well, of course it came from a manufacturer that makes chairs. It's a stupid question. But you agree it had to come from somewhere. Someone had to shape it. Yes. When you see an automobile pass by, you immediately identify, is this Mercedes? Is this Chevrolet? Is this Nissan? Is this Toyota? And they have emblems that tell you, and you can identify them immediately, yes? Using the logic. We have to look now to the universe and see. Look to the macro, the large. Look at, look at the heavens. Look all the way out as far as you can see. Use your telescope and observe those planets. Look to those stars. Look at the moon and think. And where did it come from? And why is it in this, this movement? We see cycles. We see everything in cycles. And then when we take the microscope and we look again, and how do the molecules come together? How are they formed? 
What did they tell us about the atom? How is the shape of the atom? Is it spheres surrounded by spheres? Are they in elliptical orbits? Is there a proton, a neutron, an electron? And are they moving? Why? How? Who did it? And why is it that under the microscope, I see things that are similar to what I see when I look under the telescope? And why is it that I am unable to see either one of those without optical assistance? Hmm? Is it possible that the creator of all of this has put it all together in a logical way so that the human being could look and observe? If the answer is possibly yes, then look to the Quran. Look to the Quran and see what the speech, that's what Quran means, speech of Allah, the recitation. See what it says. Because in fact, it asks you and asks me to consider, to think, to examine. Look to the heavens, it says. It even says that Allah, the creator of everything, is going to show signs, signs on the furthest horizons and within our own selves, and he'll show proofs. So this would be logic. I want to specifically now come to one of the logics that most impressed me quite by accident and how it came about. It's called Sunnah. Sunnah in the Arabic language means the way that is something is done. The moon moves a certain way. It twists and turns and goes in its orbit. The sun has an orbit that it is in. The earth is in an orbit around the sun. And all of this is called sunnah, the way that something is done. But when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he also had things that he did in a certain way things that he said, things that he did, things that he approved of or disapproved of by his actions or being silent about it. All of that is called his way or his sunnah. One night as I was riding home, I became very tired. My little daughter was with me and she turned the radio on really loud to wake up her daddy. You know, daddy, stay awake. Daddy, stay awake. I remember saying that. And she turned on the radio real loud, and as she turned it on, I heard the voice come over the radio, and he said, Always sit down when you eat or drink. So who's that? Who said that? That's in Islam. Is that a Muslim? Always sit down when you eat or drink. Never stand where you eat or drink because of the damage that it does to the various organs in the body. What is this about? It was a doctor, a surgeon, who was explaining the dangers of standing while you eat or drink. Now this was well known to Prophet Muhammad and his companions, peace be upon him, centuries ago, 1,400 years ago, that he was showing this exact same thing. Sit down when you eat or drink. But listen to what the doctor's telling us. The damage that is done to the esophagus, the damage that is done here in the lining and down what they call the hiatal hernia, which develops for people, and they get this burning and acid reflux that comes, the tearing of the stomach wall, the damage to the gallbladder, to the kidneys, to the stomach and to the bowel even, all of the operations that this doctor was describing it could be easily prevented if a person would only sit down when they eat or drink. There was a report that was issued in Washington, D.C. and in the medical journals just a few years ago dealing with the subject of the number of people who are affected and infected with herpes, and with this hepatitis, which is being spread around simply because people are communicating the disease one to the other, and largely because they're not staying clean. Now, in the West, 
we have signs in the facility, in the toilet area, telling the employees of each of the places, restaurants, fast food chains, wash your hands before you return to work. Telling them once you use the toilet, wash your hands. Yet they found that more than 70% of the employees do not obey this sign. How many? More than 70% are not washing their hands and they're having this fecal matter or urine and filth on their hands and they go right back into the kitchen and start preparing your food. When they examine closely the everyday tools and things that are used around an office and they take samples and take it to the laboratory to find out why so many employees are becoming sick and not going into work. Too many days off. The insurance companies don't like that because they have to pay for the employees who are not there. What they discovered was that on the telephone, on the keyboards of the computers, and on the desktops, books, pencils and pens, there's debris that's being left there by the hands of the people who are going into the toilet, who are dealing in different kinds of filth, and then not washing their hands and bringing it out, sneezing, coughing, and these things, and putting it right out there and sharing it with each other. All of this was mentioned in the Sunnah 1400 years ago. Let us think. Now we're talking about eating. Let's go to the next thing, what to eat. We find in previous scriptures, in the Old Testament for instance, the order for people not to eat pork. I remember in the 1950s, <laughs> the people argued against it and said, oh, that was back then, they didn't have refrigeration. Now we have good refrigerators and freezers, and we know now that that's the problem is that the meat just needs to be quickly refrigerated. And if we can just do that, then it'll be fine. In the late 1950s, they discovered it didn't work. There were other things coming out of this meat, and refrigeration didn't cure everything. 1960s, ah, now we've got a new way to deal with it. We're going to put some chemicals in the meat. Late 1960s, whoops, that didn't work. I have to try something else. Since then, they've done what they call flash freeze. Freeze it, you know? And now that should work. But yet when they thaw it out, here comes a new set of bacteria or worms and things that they have to deal with. They've even gone to the extent of doing something with radiation, radiation treatment. Can you imagine making the pig radioactive? Can you imagine glow-in-the-dark pig meat? I don't know. But... This is the kind of condition that we're in when people just don't seem to want to catch on. You were told by your creator. You were told by the one who made you and I and the pig. He made us and he told us what to do. Now, of course, we have this in Islam as well. In the Quran, there's the clear order for the believers to stay away from the laham khanzir. Laham is flesh. Khanzir means pig meat. And then somebody might say, well, okay, but that's just the flesh. We could eat the skin maybe, or we could maybe, you know, eat the feet of him. You know, they boil the pig's feet. Or maybe we could eat his ears, maybe because there's no flesh in the ear. And they start with all these arguments, and you think, are you crazy? What is the matter with you? Haven't you understood? Here, you have an order from your creator, the one who manufactured us, okay? He's giving you clear instruction, here's your book, here's the owner's manual, don't do it, and you're trying to find ways around it. What about alcohol? Again, for centuries we've been told, don't consume alcohol. It says in the Quran, more or less the meaning of it is, that there are benefits, okay, but there's damage, and the damage far outweighs any benefit you're ever going to get out of the alcohol, so leave it, do not drink it. Don't drink alcohol. Today they can show you scientifically, ah, well the, the chemical reaction inside the human being, the dependency on alcohol, there is something that's addictive within there and some people are unable to get away from the addiction when they get into alcohol. They become alcoholics and there's nothing they can do about it. 
How come we couldn't just take what it said? Don't do it. Now we've talked about putting food in and the kind of food to stay away from. What about after you've eaten it, after you've digested the food? The food's got to come out. The liquid's got to come out. Yes? So where do we find the answer on how to relieve ourselves properly according to the manufacturer's instruction, meaning the creator? What is the logic? Well, the logic would tell a person, well, if I have to go, I have to go, whatever. It doesn't matter when, where, how, just so I get relief from my problem. But actually, we know from the sunnah, the way of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that there is a time, a place, and a way for a person to do all of this. And it's spelled out real clear in Islam. First is to go far from where the people are. Of course, we know now why. But back then, it was just a matter of perhaps smell or something like that. There's a lot more to it. Go far from the people and not to contaminate the drinking water. And this was something that they made a big emphasis on. They didn't contaminate their drinking water or the water of the livestock. And for the men and women both, they were told to sit down. To sit. Because when you sit, you're following the sunnah. This is the logic. Okay? But then if a person said, well, I don't see why today. But now we find, again, we go to our scientists and they're telling us, oh, the one who stands and tries to relieve themselves is causing damage. And again, just as we learned about what happens when you eat and stand, also when you relieve and stand, it can cause problems. And the list goes on. But suffice to say, the proper way for both male and female is to sit while they relieve themselves. And when they finish, and now today to be sophisticated, to be up to date, of course, you will use paper to clean yourself. And this is considered very hygienic. But in fact, if you were to go to the doctors, if you were to go to the hospital, and there was going to be an operation performed on your body, would they wipe you down with paper? Or do they wipe you down with some type of solution and do they use like alcohol to clean you and things like that and the answer is yes they do they are cleaning you with liquid they're washing you with a liquid soap why aren't they using paper well the doctor will tell you right away it leaves debris it leaves particles of the paper itself and it doesn't get you clean and when the doctor gets ready to do the surgery does he wipe his hands with paper or does he wash and the answer is he washes. He doesn't even dry his hands on any towel because he doesn't want to pick up any germs. Is that true or false? And the answer is yes. So if you understand that, how come you can't understand that what you were told in the logic of the Sunnah is for you, me, and for all times? Let's take one more example and just think about it. Suppose, suppose you went out to pick up the Sunday paper. You're out here, I'm going to get the Sunday paper today. You reach down to pick up the paper out in the yard, you know, and you grab it. And oh my goodness, somebody's dog has passed by and done something in the yard. Now I have it on my hand. Well, remember what we told you in the first place? You're supposed to have used your left hand, weren't you? But you didn't. You reached with the right to pick something up out of the dirt. All right, let's say I picked it up with the left hand, all right? I still have the stuff on there. Am I going to take part of the paper and wipe it? Or am I going to go to the faucet, turn it on, and wash it off? And the answer is known to you and I both. You're going to use water to wash it off. The water's the answer. And that's what was told to us 1,400 years ago. The logic is there. So many things that as I began to learn about this thing called sunnah, it's just practical application. But check this out. And if this doesn't get you, I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. In Spain, during the heyday of Islam, when the real science was being brought there a thousand years ago, when people were really thinking, reflecting, and teaching, and they were into astronomy, geology, hydrology, and understanding how the water cycles work, many of the great sciences and disciplines were being developed at that time. And people traveled from all over the world, from Europe especially, to come and to be educated here. But at that time, 
was called the Dark Ages. And there was the Black Plague. And the people were suffering and dying en masse all through Europe. But this was not happening amongst the Muslims. The Muslims were free from that. And even when the Europeans came and brought their plague with them, they would even die. But the Muslims didn't catch it. It didn't spread. Now today, they can explain it to you real easy. They go, well, that's pretty simple. The Muslims were washing themselves at least five times a day. They were cleaning themselves the way a surgeon does today. They ate with their right, not with the left. So they didn't pick up this infectious diseases. And when they eliminated, they had a certain place and a way, and they washed everything away with water, just as we use the modern day toilets, washing it away. All of this was 1,400 years ago. That's where it started. A thousand years ago, we see what happened in Spain. And none of them ever got it. In fact, they showed the people of Europe what to do to cure their problem. And they took it all from what? The logic. The facet of Islam called logic. Now, it's not the logic of you and I, and it's not the logic of the scientists that I'm talking about. It's the logic of the Creator who knew what He created in the first place. And when He gives us something as beautiful and as simple to use, as something called Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa peace be upon him, then what is stopping us from using our logic to recognize, hey, this is something that I need for me. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Simple as that. Simple logic. Here we have the example in front of us. We know that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last messenger for all human beings, for all time. And he's telling us, do this, don't do that. Follow this way, follow this sunnah. So this is the logic of the sunnah. One of the many beautiful aspects of Islam. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.